grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Part of God's word for our consideration this day is written for us in the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 43, verses 16 through 21. This is what the Lord says, who makes a road through the sea and a path through mighty waters, who brings out the chariot and the horses, the army and the strong warrior. They will all lie down together. They will not get up. They are extinguished like a wick. They go out. Do not remember the former things. Do not keep thinking about ancient things. Watch, I'm about to do a new thing. Now it will spring up. Don't you know about it? Indeed, I will make a road in the wilderness. In the wasteland, I will make rivers. The wild animals, the jackals and ostriches will honor me because I am providing water in the wilderness. Rivers in a parched wasteland, water for my chosen people to drink. This people that I formed for myself will declare my praise. This is God's word. Dear friends in Christ. Sunday night in September 1918, so just about the end of World War I, and the great tenor Enrico Caruso was just knocking him dead at the Century Theater, New York City. He was doing a special program for something called the Army Tank Corps Welfare League, and he was singing a series of his versions of some Italian war songs. Now, do not Ask me, please, to explicate any further on either of those last two items. I don't have any idea. But for his grand finale, he came out and burst forth in his expressive take on a very patriotic song, Over There. And it just wowed the audience. They were going wild. Who could ever follow an act like that? Well, it only took a few seconds to find out who could follow and act like that. As all of a sudden, bounding out from the offstage area, here comes this, this young guy, and, and he's got this mischievous smile on his face, and he's got this confidence about him as he leans over and yells to the audience, you ain't heard nothing yet. Brought the house down. Al Jolson, you're right. Al Jolson considered the world's greatest entertainer at that time, and, and he came through on it. He had them forgetting this world's greatest opera singer before he was two bars in to the next song. You ain't heard nothing yet. About 10 years later, this same world's greatest entertainer. And he's up on another stage, a stage that's about to introduce something called the talkies into the motion picture industry, something that I guess was going to probably have a pretty decent future. And as he is part of this stage, it was called the Jazz Singer. As he is part of this stage, the plan for the day was to have some orchestra music in there and some other added special effects. But still for the dialogue, you're still going to have to read those black cards with the sentences on them in between the lines of dialogue. Until, until Al Jolson saw an open microphone. And right before the first chords of the orchestra started, he leaned in and said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I tell you, you ain't heard nothing yet. And then the real life son of a Jewish rabbi Cantor and the, also the play acting one merged together on this stage presentation for the first talking picture sensation. And the rest was history. You ain't heard nothing yet. You ain't seen nothing yet. Now, now, if Al Jolson says that, or Bachman Turner Overdrive sings that, or some other entertainer says that, okay, okay. But how about if the Lord God Almighty makes that same exact declaration? The God of all power and glory and strength and might who can do anything and has proven it over and over again. I mean, he's done some pretty big stuff before, you got to admit. But what if he were to break in into the middle of things and to all of a sudden make this kind of a claim? Well, you're in luck because you happen to be sitting in the right seats at the right time for hearing him do exactly just that. I tell you, you ain't heard nothing yet. You ain't seen nothing yet. I've done some big things before, but now I've got something brand new for you. And this isn't bluster. This isn't hyperbole. This isn't bragging. This isn't like what we do with our 
our little resolutions where, well, if everything works out, this is how I plan to make things happen. Right, our New Year's resolutions. Yep, starting tomorrow, 5 a.m., I'm going to go out running two miles every day, or I'm going to hit the gym every day, I'm going to lose whatever weight, I'm going to give up donuts or smoking or, or whatever it is. I'm going to get this garage cleaned out and everything organized, and it's going to stay spotless for the rest of forever. And, yeah, those resolutions, at least for me, so far in the rearview mirror that I don't even feel bad about having discarded them along the road so long ago. But that's us. That's our resolutions, not God. God says something, it happens. And this is promises from a God who does not go back on his promise, a God who cannot break his promises. That's just how he is, and that's just who he is. This is what the Lord says, who makes a road through the sea and a path through mighty waters, who brings out the chariot and the horses, the army and the strong warrior. They will all lie down together. They will not get up. They are extinguished. Oh, come on. You can't tell me that God's people had really already forgotten that defining moment of their national and personal identity already. No, they hadn't. They recognized this. These are the words from that song of Moses after they'd gotten busted free from the land of slavery oh so many years ago. Of course they remember this. These are, these are the, the Chicago Bear fans thinking back to the days of the, the monsters on the midway some eight decades or so ago. These are the people who this is the story they always told their kids and grandkids. This is the event that they were always celebrating in their parties and feasts and festivals. This was the thing that, that, that kept them so happy in their good times and, and encouraged and built them up in their bad times. This is what told them they had a God who looked out for his people and would do absolutely anything to rescue them and take care of them. And this was supposed to be the thing that they looked at to see the even greater rescue that was coming the impossible thing where God would actually rescue them from their sin and guilt and all its consequences like death and hell. They remembered this. That's what they talked about all the time, every time they needed an illustration. I mean, at least I have three or four different stories that I use with you. No, no, no. They're, they're preachers. They just always went back to the same story, the Exodus. That time that God delivered, that God came in with shock and awe and took out the one and only superpower in the world at that time. The one and only superpower who happened to be foolish enough to enslave the very people of the Lord God Almighty. And with amazing displays of power through and over nature, God built up and rescued his despairing people. He hardened those, those rebellious rejectors, those unbelievers, and he even broke the spirit of that oh-so-proud King Pharaoh. And then if that weren't enough, I mean, just think of what God did in all those ten plagues and getting his people broken free from the land of slavery. As if that weren't enough, well, here, you're getting the rest of the song, right? He baits the enemy into trying for round two. He takes his people, and instead of going straight up to the promised land, he takes them wandering and going around in circles until they look like they're trapped between these high cliffs and the edge of the ocean. And not a very good thing to do militarily, right? That's what Pharaoh's thinking as he sends out the rest of his forces and his armies led by 600 of his best chariots. That was the most firepower anybody had at that time. And he sends his armies after these people of God or at least alleged people of God because now they're whining and complaining and also in fear for their lives. Really, this God who had just shown himself so clearly and so fully is going to come through on the first 90% of his promise and then somehow fall apart at the very end right before he gets to the good part? Are you kidding me? And then those actual enemies of God to be so foolish as to set themselves and their will completely to be the opposite of what God's holy will is. So God has Moses move the people on. Move the people on where? 
Oh, he opens up the ocean and they walk through on the dry land. Yeah, there was some wind and stuff involved, but that's not the, the miracle. The Bible tells us that there were walls of water on both sides of them. Two million or more people with all their luggage, all their baggage, all their livestock, they get through in the middle of the night across the ocean and their feet didn't even get wet. Amazing. What's even more amazing is that these foolish enemies of God we're going to try to follow him in. And as the people of God get to the other side, what does God do to show his power and encourage his people even more and to show his judgment when it's time? That's enough. And the waters come close. And there are no survivors. They will not get up, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. That was pretty impressive, wasn't it? That was, that was powerful. But now, as hard as it must be for the people of God to even begin to imagine something greater than that, something greater than that rescue from Egypt and all those miracles that went along with that and God's plan shown to be in spite of everything, you get it? He said, no, no, no. You ain't seen nothing yet. This is going to be something so great, you're going to stop telling the kids and grandkids that last story. You're going to have a new, new story that you're going to tell them for the upcoming generation. See, the first section of the book of Isaiah have been talking a lot of judgment and punishment and what people deserve as a consequence for not living up to the will of a holy God who has certain demands. So yeah, because of their sins, and there was going to be punishment. But worse, if they didn't realize their sinfulness and look to God for their Savior and, and look and see what he was telling them and hear what his messengers were saying as they even gave them a whole blueprint of how this thing was going to go, taking the first half of the nation and showing step by step by step how it's going to go, and they're taken off and disappear completely into the Assyrian captivity. The Assyrians conquer these people and now Isaiah is coming and saying, you saw that. You saw that. Now this is exactly the same steps. We were looking in the book of Jeremiah last week, and people were going, well, well, uh, how do they know to listen to Jeremiah, not that other guy in the temple that, that's saying something different? Well, here's how. They've had the book of, of Isaiah here for 100 years. They've had God's word, and they could see how God fulfilled every step of it along the way before, and now they see what God says for now. Simple thing. Match what that preacher's saying with what God's holy revealed word says. And so they had it. They had the whole, the whole outline of what was going to happen, and still the same thing's going to happen. Because as their God tells them, if you don't shape up, and I know you're not going to shape up, you're going to lose it. The real people, the, the Judah, the Jerusalem, the, the, the temple, and, and all the people around the temple. God was calling his shot, wasn't he? This is even more clear than, than that Babe Ruth calling his home run shot, 1932 World Series. But if you ask the actual eyewitnesses and ear witnesses, it wasn't exactly like the way most of us think. But here, God's calling his shot, and he really is. The Babylonians. In another, another century, the Babylonians are going to come down and they're going to completely wipe out the Assyrians and extend the boundaries of their empire even further and they're going to demolish this place. And at that time in that place, that would be telling us, like telling us, oh, yeah, uh, Paraguay is going to come next century and conquer the whole United States and, and ship all the people down there. And Except for one little detail. The one little detail is this is God himself saying it. And when God himself says something, it happens exactly the way God himself says, as he's repeated for so many times all throughout history. It's not just that one little passage in Peter's epistle that tells us everything is breathed out by God that comes in what we call his holy Bible. He tells us on every single page, thus saith the Lord. This is the true, inspired, inerrant word of God Almighty. And the only way you can know any of it is true is that you can know that all of it is true. And so there it was. And so it did happen, just like God had said. And even that, that wasn't the big news. Remember I said that the first part of Isaiah was about judgment and, and harshness and, and the results of the sin. The, Isaiah's just gotten to the part where the tone changes. And now it's about rescue 
and deliverance. And, and, and in terms of something, for most of them, they're going to be saved from something that didn't even happen yet. As yeah, this Babylonian captivity was going to come in, and, and, and when the Babylonians came in, they made every other empire before them look weak and kind and benevolent in comparison. But after they had outlived their usefulness in God's long-term plan, they became a prop to be exploded, demolished for the Lord by the Lord, for the glory of the Lord. And he's calling it right here in Isaiah. That's going to be another exodus, but only in reverse. The, this God who first had made a dry way through the sea so his people could get out, what's he going to do now? He's going to bring them back through the dry way, through the desert way, but he's going to make it lush and, and flowing with rivers and, and, and even lush vegetation and flowers and animals who praise the name of the Lord? Yeah, as he explains in the rest of his word, God did use Nebuchadnezzar and this whole Babylonian hordes to, to destroy Jerusalem, to wipe out this, this physical, political entity, to take the flower and pride of Judah off into, into the Babylonian captivity. But this same God was going to even more dramatically and more powerfully rescue and release his people, get them back to their homeland and temple. He says, you ain't seen nothing yet. And God's making his call. When I was in college in Watertown, Wisconsin, Watertown, Wisconsin, at that time, <clears throat> no, and this is truth, not just hyperbole like I'm sometimes prone to. Uh, this is, was considered to be the, the town or village or city in America with the most churches per capita. At the same time, it was also said to be the town or village with the most bars or taverns per capita in the United States of America. And those were 10 to 1 or 20 to 1 more than the churches. So sometimes some of us at the college frequented some of those establishments. Not so much for the beer, maybe more for the pool, right? Uh, we had one guy in our class. He was really, really good at pool, but he had this kind of annoying habit, unless you're on his team. He would uh, have these times, and I, and I know sometimes in real pool you're supposed to call your shots, but... He had this habit where he'd sit there and he'd lean and he'd chalk up his Q-tip and then he'd point with the Q-tip to the ball and tell everyone in the room where that ball was going to go and how. And then he'd set the cue down and he'd look and he says, I promise. And every time he said that, he made it. He, every single time. He didn't say, I promise, every time he shot a shot. But every time he said, I promise, the ball went in right where he said. God doesn't even have to chalk up his cue. God calls his shot. He's calling his shot even a hundred years before there was a Babylon as a power. He's calling his shot for a hundred years after that when that power would be completely eliminated. He even names the guy. In the next two chapters of Isaiah, he calls him out as Cyrus, the leader of this Medo-Persian empire that's going to obliterate Babylon and the whole Babylonian empire and extend his empire even further. And that's not even the most amazing thing. Here's this guy who wipes out this whole empire and then tells this one group of malcontents in the middle of it, oh, you can go back home and you can go start your own religion again and you can hear, here's some extra money to build your temple with. And God is calling his shot and he says, I promise. I promise the word from, from the one whose word can call into existence what he wants. Let there be light. And it is. That word that calls something into existence and makes it be. The world. Human beings with our eternal souls. The entire universe. Our salvation. Here he's calling his shot. He says, mark it down. You can write this one down. And it was impressive. It was incredible. And it was spectacular. But once again, you guessed it. You ain't seen nothing yet. Because here what he's telling them, he's telling them is to be just a little sliver, just a little glimpse of this powerful, great event that's coming up, the foreshadowing of the biggest rescue ever. Where God, God sent his one and only son to come and get us sinful people back on the same page as a holy God to do what was absolutely impossible get his perfect righteousness to be credited to do us and then get his suffering and death on the cross to be the price that paid off all our debts for all our guilt before a holy God. 
destroy all the enemies all at once. So the devil can't even accuse us. Sin can't even control us. Death can't even contain us. He saved us for the praise of his glory, he tells us. And there too, you ain't seen nothing yet because we're just getting started. The new creation that he's made of each one of us, the new creatures connected to him, made his twice. Yeah, when he first formed us, but then again, he redeemed us and now connects us to that Jesus, our Savior, and puts us to where we're waiting to see one more thing, one more thing even bigger, but already previewed for us. If you read to the very, very end of God's book, you can see it. The new heaven and the new earth, that home forever for us beyond what we can imagine or guess. So perfect, so beautiful, so wonderful, so exciting, and well, you ain't seen nothing yet. And we can't wait. Amen. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Having listened to the word of our holy God, we now have the opportunity to confess the faith he's given us. We do that this morning using the words of the Nicene Creed. Would you please stand as you are able? <clears throat> we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated.